I welcome each and every one of you this morning. You know that strength is not with the multitude, but strength is also with a smaller group. And it's not how many we are in here, in this building today, but how much we love the Lord. Amen. That's what counts. And the Lord is here, and I can feel it, and I am grateful to be here this morning. Thank you for your gracious pastor that invited me, and I have met Chad, just a wonderful substitute here for you this morning. And uh, I can truly say that he stole my heart already in Jesus. <laughs> so he loves the Lord. <clears throat> I came from a long way. My name is Barbara Bicky. I was born and raised in Hungary. I came from the family of seven, four daughters, a built-in quartet, and three brothers. My two brothers uh, we have lost in a very early age in diphtheria. In the 1930s, as you remember, and the late 20s, diphtheria has swept the whole world, and we lost many due to not to have the shots that we need to, to be healed. And so my father and mother watched the two little, two little boys suffocating in their arms within two weeks of what? And she said, you think it's painful when you're having a baby, but you can imagine when you lose two at almost the same time. And in those days, it was difficult to bury the children or anyone that passed away because we, the first Baptist, did not have a cemetery. So we were not allowed to put our babies to rest in the Catholic cemetery at that time. So they buried my brothers at the outskirts of the cemetery by the ditch. And my parents has written to Budapest and complained that it cannot be, that it should be a cemetery. So they finally got together and they made it possible to have a small cemetery for the Christian people so they can be de a decent way buried and, and have peace of mind. And that happened, praise the Lord, and my brothers were moved. But these are just some of the things that you were persecuted, not by just the, the outsiders, but you were persecuted from the insiders. But God's Holy Spirit does not rest. It's keep working. Pretty soon there was 24 of them saved all at once. So my father and mother was the first fruit of an evangelist that came from the Martin Luther branch and into the first Baptist were born in Germany. So they came and preached with and without season and my parents were happy that they were part of that teaching and uh, we were raised with the Word of God and thank God with the Christian parents Many persecution has come after that, but I'll get back to you later on. <clears throat> I live in Palisade. I have two wonderful sons and uh, seven grandchildren because we also adopted a, a son that lost his father and mother and his grandparents. So we claim him also. Uh, my husband went to be with the Lord 11 years ago, who also were saved in a refugee camp in Austria and were baptized there, where we met and we were married in the courts of Vienna and a little Baptist church in Hütteldorf. So we ought to be married very well, he said to me one time, because we were married three times. <laughs> so, so it, it was, and it was a wonderful life. Leslie passed away with leukemia, not being diagnosed, but six years later when they found out that he has leukemia. So he did not have much chance 
uh, to be better. They could not change the bone marrow by that time. But he left a legacy. Never give up. Love each other. Love God and carry on. Amen. He left a great legacy for his children and grandchildren. My grandson is going back to the Middle East the fourth time in the army with the special forces. He's been to Hallelujah. Afghanistan three times and now it's Iraq. Please remember him in your prayers. His name is Brendan Bicky and he's serving in the United States Army. Thank you. He seems like following his father's footsteps. My oldest son was in the Navy and in the Army for 20 years. So we saw a little soldier growing up right before our eyes. Uh, I attend uh, to New Horizon First Four Square Church at this time because my son Leslie, that was in the Army, was a youth pastor there at one time. So we went to support him. But you know, folks, God is everywhere. Amen. Where we seek Him Amen. in spirit and in truth, right. He is there. Amen. My uh, <clears throat> scripture this morning is uh, for all of us, and it is found in Second Chronicle, chapter seven, verse fourteen. And Chad, if you would be kind enough to come up and, and read that for us this morning. St. Chronicles 7, 14. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then... I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Yes, this is, this is my wish for America. And we know that we're going through uh, a, a difficult time. And may God's word encourage you Amen. and fill your hearts. And uh, I know that whatever people does, sometime it's overlooked by God because it's not finished until God puts his finish mark right. on everything in our life. So we fully trust in God for our country and as you see, it's a promise to us that if we turn away from our sins and we seek his face, and pray for forgiveness, he will hear us and he will heal our land. Amen. So we rest in God's hand for everything in our lives. When I was born in Hungary, difficult times were, war came and gone, and uh, many things took place. I lived under freedom and I had the taste of freedom, but in my second grade, my life has changed tremendously. When communism took over after the Second World War, everything changed. Our world turned upside down. I used to march under Christian song in my school. Our teacher used to pray we used to pledge allegiance to the Hungarian flag and we used to sing religious songs and Christian songs. But when Russia took over, everything went out. Here went our flag, here went the prayers, the Bibles were burned on the boulevard, you must submit it to the higher authorities, to our a communist party. You have to get rid of all of those things. 
The name of God will not be mentioned again in schools and in public. You were severely punished for it. So one morning in my second grade, there was a special teacher, a speaker, and he came to teach us where we came from. So he began to say that we evolved from monkeys. And I just sat there and I just fidgeted uh, up and down. I did not know which way to turn. Spit on the floor. But it did not <laughs> sit with me. So he said, don't anyone has a question. Do you believe that you are from monkey? So I held my hands up and I said, no, sir, you may be but not me. <laughs> the entire, entire class began to shout and laugh and he was so embarrassed and he was so upset with me. And he said, I will see you after school. So when he went on and saying his uh, message, he spoke about the world, how the world evolved and one of the little boy held up his hand and he said, Son, he said, Sir, who brings the sun up each morning? What do you do for that sun to come up if there is no God? And he thought for a moment and he could not answer. Another popped up. How about the stars that shines by the millions? Who put them up there? There was no answer. And he said, well, can we just change the subject? <laughs> the, te uh, the, the special uh, instructor, the teacher said, but I was told that I will be met in the back at the school when it was over. And I knew what was waiting for me. I had to put my hands together like this. And you know those fishing rods that swing so well. I got hit five times on top on that fingernails and the blood was flowing down by the time he got through. Now, he says, don't you understand? You never mention the name of God in this school again. And then they called my parents and they told them that they can put them to jail for several weeks for what I said to keep your children's mouth shut. So, here it goes. Freedom of speech went. You could never say anything that was on your mind, especially in public, unless you were with your entire family. Closed doors. Then when you lost that, you lost, you lost it all. Because you can never criticize, never say anything about the government. Then they put the iron curtain up that covered it all. No one could come in and no one could go out. Folks, this is communism. It's not capitalism. There is a difference like heaven and earth between the two. And then the next we hear is coming. Everyone must register your weapons. We did, and very soon they came and confiscated from everyone. People, don't ever give up your arms, Amen. your weapons. Amen. That's when you left. That's when we were left hopelessly, because we could not even defend ourselves or our family from intrusion. And it went on. People in a higher bracket were highly taxed, so much so that they could not bear the burden, they couldn't hold on to their land. Oh, we're just going to share the wealth. Have you heard that word? <laughs> yeah, I did too. I heard that in Hungary. And here too. So we could not even imagine what that meant shared the wealth. They took it from everybody that was over so many acreage. And then came to the middleman. And they came to the small businessman. 
you had to give up your business. You were stayed to work for a flat rate and whatever your business brought, it went to the government. Same way with the land. They came and pretty soon when you couldn't pay any more taxes because they offered a lot of freebies. They told everybody you're going to get this share, you're going to get this privilege, you're going to get paid school, paid college, uh, free meal, free this, free that, and free everything. By the time our people paid for all these freebies, we were paying 60% taxes. Now after that, when you could no longer pay your taxes, you see how they work? They say, now we see you have a problem, you cannot pay your taxes. Can we just come and take your land and make a collective farm out of this or collective businesses? And the government will pay you a flat rate and we take the income. And the government did take all. We came down, my parents, that they did not even have enough to feed the children. I mean, if they cannot make you, they break you. My family was so hungry that we could eat a rat if we could have found, because we had no food at all. When you lost everything, my father was a wonderful farmer. We raised bountiful food, but it's all gone, folks. My parents had nothing. My father went out in the evening at dusk with a shovel. Remember, you have no more gun. It took your privilege of hunting. You lose that too. So, Daddy went out to the forest. And toward evening, he was managed to kill a rabbit with a shovel. And it was cold. It was in, in November. And... Uh, he put it under his coat and he said, Oh, I can take it home and my wife can prepare a meal for the children and we'll have enough to eat. But his hope didn't last that very long. The Gestapo jumped out from the bushes who was guarding the forest and said, What do you have under your coat? I see that you put something in there. He opened Daddy's coat and the rabbit fell out and he picked it up and he says, you are trespassing in the government land and, and you, you should be in jail for this, that you have killed this rabbit. You are not allowed to hunt and you know that it belongs to us, the great, great party. My mother, my mother did not know why Daddy was so late, but it took a long time before a friend arrived as the Gestapo was stalking to my Daddy. <clears throat> and this friend said, what seems to be wrong? And he said, this man is stealing our property, our goods. And of course he didn't make himself very disguised, he knew my dad, this second person. And he was afraid that my daddy will be put away. Oh, he said, why don't you just let this man go? You would do the same thing if your children were hungry. So finally, reluctantly, he let my daddy go. But he kept the rabbit. The Gestapo did not give the rabbit back. My dad came home very disappointed. I needless, needless to say that we were all disappointed. We had nothing to eat again for one more day and one more night. It went on and on until they got all, when they had taken everything. And if you ever said anything against them, if you refused to salute, if you refuse to sing their anthem to march on earth, if you refuse to do the work that they saved for you, because the elite got the best jobs, and the ones that never turned to be a communist were left behind. So folks, when you hear socialism in this country, so socialism is a foundation of communism.
Right. This right. is when they began to build and brainwash people. And do you know how much they offer, but they never say who's going to pay for it? Right. You and I will. Come on. Very high price. Mm -hmm. And America was an enemy to the Soviet Union because you were not red. Because you treat your people with freedom and love and kindness. You help a needy. My goodness, I never seen a country so gracious and so giving as you are. I am a recipient of that, that you have done. We received the little care packages in Austria at the refugee camp and how eager we were to open it and see what was inside. I'll tell you what was inside, what we really needed that we didn't have, a bar of soap, a shampoo, a conditioner, a washcloth, a bottle of aspirin. To write letters, you had envelopes and writing papers and pencils and papers. We cherish that for so much. And it said on the outside, USA cares. Amen. I want to thank you in behalf of the 250,000 that left the country since that time. Yes, you have received us. You have given us over and above. And you are exceptional, and you are special, and don't let anyone tell you that you aren't. Because I am here to tell you that you are. So when the people were hungry and there was no more time left, Hungary is a very small country as you see, only a little over 12 million, the last one that I have heard, but Hungary was subdivided after the Trianon and left a tiny country for us. They have taken five different nations taken from us, Russia, Romania, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. So this is all what we have left. You could drive through it in one day, in the entire country. But what I like to express to you, after we were practically <clears throat> left hopeless, our men were taken to prison because we would not give up the land. My brother-in-law was locked up. For 11 years, my sister was left with two little girls, very young age, and they beat them every day and they did not feed them, just to confess even more than what they did. He told them that he will not going to give up his business or the land over their dead bodies. And I hate you communists. He said these words, he was locked up that long. He had three nervous breakdown, and they asked when he was freed, what did they do to you that was the worst? He said, when they shot my fingers between the door, and I heard them crack. So they destroyed both of his hands. He could no longer feed himself when he came back from the communist prison. Folks, Prison is not like it is under communism. Prison is a place where you are punished severely and they want you to be broken so that you will give everything forcefully. And when the spirit is broken, folks, they can do a lot of things to you. But we heard the radio Free Europe. We heard your voice, America. Amen. You were telling us not to give up. We were underground. We listened to Billy Graham's tape underground. We worshipped underground. They, the songs had to be very quiet to be sang. 
It had to be one by one or two by one, the middle of a night, together, together, because we were afraid we were going to be discovered. Hungary suffered a lot. Turkish occupied us for 150 years, and we were slaves to the Turkish. You know, they're talking about slavery. Well, let's look back. Hungary is over a thousand years old, and they wonder what happened in this thousand years. Hungary was born 884 AD. So Hungary is now over 1,150 years old. And the Turkish did a great damage to us. What they do to, did to our ancestors is they put men and woman neck into the yoke of the animal's yoke. And they plowed the land with my ancestors, with my people. When somebody done something wrong and you didn't do what the Turkish emperor told you to do so, they built a huge wagon wheel and they crucified you on that wheel and they built a fire underneath and as they rolled the wheel, they roasted you. Have you seen a slave being killed that way in America? No but you don't hear about it. So what we had to do, Hungarians, forget the 150 years, forget what they done for us and bury the hatchet and leave it there. Forgive, forgiveness also set you free. Amen. And what we're suffering in our country today, we don't seem to be forgive. We just, we just keep carrying the hatchet. And I hope and pray that God will intervene and bring that peace about it for those that are restless today. I ask the peace of God for forgiveness. And we can start a new beginning. Amen. We can love each other like we never loved before. Amen. We can help each other like we never helped before. Because when the love of God takes hold, we melt together in the love of God. Amen. And oh, it's so wonderful to feel, feel to be free. You know, I can hate the Russian soldiers all I want that raped my family and my neighbors when my sisters were buried in the dungeon and all the neighbor girls, because that's what they did. They carried them off in their camp and they made them work night and day and they raped them at night at all ages. This is war, folks, that I have seen with my eyes. And I thought I cannot bear it. Without our father, my mother had a heart attack. I, as an eight-year-old, was left above the ground. I had to prepare whatever I found in the field, sugar beets. I glean the land that was left behind because the soldiers cleaned everything out. We had nothing left to eat. Mother instructed me how to pick up and, and glean the potatoes from the ground and wherever a corn was left halfway tortured, pick them up and make, make a cornmeal out of it. And my little hands, I have made the ground going on and, and I couldn't reach it sometime and it took me up and I got rubbed down. But mother told me what to do. But one evening, folks, I forgot to take the meal to my sisters and to all those girls in the dungeon that my father built before he left to the war. Remember, in the Second World War, they drafted our men from 60 to 16. That took everybody from my family, my brother, my father. But he left us with a hope that you be vigilant. Without ceasing, you pray, you fast, 
Don't you never forget that you're free in God and He can free you again. Well, I forgot the food that night. And pretty soon my sister Sarah, the eldest, come in. And I said, oh Sarah, don't come yet. The Kozak just passed by a little while ago on two horseback. But Sarah prepared the food and tried to take some down to the dungeon. Sometimes we have 20, sometimes we had 22 down there. And it was difficult for me to feed. There was no light. They were in complete darkness for six months. They could only crawl, crawl up at night to empty their waste buckets. And they could not light candles because the smoke smothered them. So they were completely shut down from the light. And it took them a long time for their eyes to get used to the light. But here came the Cossacks. I said, Sarah, get out. They are here. But she had no time. She scooted down beside the stove, the wooden stove. We had no gas. We had kerosene lamp. We had no indoor toilet. We had no lights. There was nothing like that in America, which I admired when I came. But the Cossacks came. They immediately discovered her, and they began to whip her with a horse whip. And, uh, and she shouted to me, Barbara, get crazy. Scream from the top of your voice, because one of them stood and blocked the door. So I got down in the foyer, and the other stopped when my mother was in bed. And we did not know what was wrong with my mother because she didn't know either. But she couldn't be up, she couldn't walk. She couldn't talk very much. And so the soldiers were already there. And as I threw a fit and, and I kicked and I screamed, I took their attention. And Sarah took between one of the soldiers' legs, went into the bedroom where my mother was in the bed, and took the window with its free frame and broke out. And we don't know if she ran to the mountain between a, a little forest or she, she hides somewhere in a barn. But what she did, it was amazing. But the soldiers shoot up the hole inside. Then they came in and threw mother off of the bed. And remember, I was only eight years old. I did not know what to think. And I was just, I was just shaken from fear. And so they began to kick my mother with their boots and they took the end of the, the machine gun and they hit her very hard. And from that time she spoke no more. And I thought my mother was dead. So I ran out the street and I yelled, somebody, anybody, please come. They're going to kill my mother. And this gentle little gray-headed man came. And she said, he said, Ma, what's wrong, ch child? What's wrong? I said, please go see my mother. I think she's dead. And then the soldiers were still shooting outside. They came in and finally they decided they couldn't find anybody but me. So they didn't take me. And the elderly man was about 90, left from the war. And he tried to consult me. And, and, and try to pat my hands and my head. It's going to be all right. And we waited. He finally departed and ran down. There was no doctors in the city no more. Remember, the soldiers, the Russians especially, took the lawyers, the engineers, the doctors, the nurses. They took them with their regiment to, to fix the bridges, the lawyers to take care of their business, the nurses to attend to their sick and wounded. So they, the town didn't have no doctor. So lo and behold, he brings a Russian army doctor to my mother. And we were so scared to look at him, his uniform. But he slowly walked toward my mother and lifted her up and put her back in the bed. And then began to administer to, to her to bring her back and give her medication. So he, he showed me a handful of medicine and he said, Klop Klop, which is child, give two of this to Mamka. And he showed the clock to me how much I was to wait for each pill giving. And I was so grateful. 
and then he went and covered my mother, and mother reached for his hand. She wanted to thank him for what she did. And this Russian doctor says, he could not say it, but we knew, he knew God. And when he left, he, he bowed before my mother and left. From that day on, I know what to expect. He told me that Mamka had a heart attack. And it'll be a long time before she'd be ready to take her responsibility. So I had to walk down at night in the dungeon and tell my sisters what, what the news was. And they were trying to come up at night so that I would not have to do so much. Folks, war is horrible. And you know, I can complain all I want, but there is only one peace in my heart, and that peace of forgiveness, and the peace that I have with God. Amen. And with that hope, and with that hope, and with God's love, you can break any chain. Amen. 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 There is no chain that God cannot break. And you're free. It's not enough to be free physically. But it's very important to be free spiritually. Yes. I must go on. I go from now on into our escape. For 12 years, the regime was so difficult and so dreadful that we could not say nothing against the regime. <clears throat> you could not talk to your neighbors. You could not go anywhere without registration. If I came from Palisade, if I was under communism, I would have been stopped by the Gestapo three, four times. Where I was going, what I was going to do, when I'm going to return. Then they come at night and they rouse up everybody and search you, searching for partisan, searching for enemy. Well, who is the enemy? We were glad to be alive. We, uh, instead of doing anything, just stay alive. <clears throat> then they came and they took uh, all the uh, account. They counted everybody in the entire country. Who you are, what is your affiliation, what religion you are, how old you are, when were you born, why were you born sometime. So we had a book, everything is written down, who you were. In that book, they saw a minute, they opened it up, who you were. And when they find you were a Christian, no job. When you went to bread, get bread, or go to the butcher shop, you got bones. The elite, the communists, got the, the meat. Uh, the, the treatment was harsh, folks. It was so harsh that... Sometimes we wonder, those that did not know the Lord, why are we living if they are persecuted us so much? So when there is no hope left, we were listening to the radio Free Europe. And we knew that the Russians has exhausted our country already. Everything the best they took, and it will be us next time. And, but the border was heavily guarded. Two Russian soldiers and two Hungarian. They didn't trust the Hungarian alone. And the mines were placed beneath the bob wire. So even when you crawl underneath, you never knew when you hit the mines. When the food was so scarless, and we had no jobs because we were not communist, we were not one of them. And when you were sick and you went to the doctor, you were left behind, sit there all day long to get in, folks. That's a socialist medicine and a socialized medicine and socialized doctors. When you have them, you are left behind, believe me. Only those 
that was one of them got in and you sit there all day and when you didn't get in you had to come back next day hopefully that next day you get in the line again and get in and sometimes there was such a severe sick person that they couldn't make it to the next day and they did not get the help so folks when you hear the word of socialism it leads to communism and communism is the place that I would never, ever want to be again. So we decided when we lost all our privileges and we had no hope left and they wanted more and more, we the people worked for peace work, not by hourly wage. And the quota was so high that you could never reach the high ground the high pay. So that meant you were kept down on the low wages at all time. In your own country, in your own language, in your own knowledge that you have learned, you could not use because you were kept down there. Injustice. So we the people rise up and the bloody revolution began. And Russia did not know what to do with us. Thirteen days we shook the Kremlin. We begged the world, civilized people of the world, please come to our aid. Can't you see once we perish, your turn comes also? 1968? 1956 revolution. October the 23rd, last Sunday, was the anniversary of 58 years of that revolution that I was in. When we had no hope left, and we seen the people dying left and right, when we had people standing in line for bread, four o'clock in the morning and in the evening at five, they tell you that the line will be end because there is no more bread. You went home one more day hungry. Young people, these university students wanted nothing. They just wanted to take down the red flag. They were gone down right there underneath the flag. They didn't have to fight. They didn't have to say a word. They just wanted to get rid of the communist flag. Freedom. Freedom. You cannot buy. Freedom take sacrifice and for that we must rise we had nothing to fight with a few guns a few hand grenades general malator took an ambulance into the army barracks they loaded them with gun emptied the first aid and loaded them with guns and that was the first weapons that our revolutionary people received but it wasn't enough to start a revolution with. But whoever was, men and women and girls and boys, age up to 14, 15 years old, we have a nuns who are with us and, and let go against this great might. Whatever happens to us, we cannot be treated any worse. We cannot be no more hungry. We can no more helpless. We need to be free. So as the, the group began, we began to sing the Hungarian national anthem. God bless the Hungarians. And when that went through the entire country, in every city and in every town, they began to gather and tearing the flag down. And that was the opportunity for me. I left my job. I did not even say goodbye. I left everything behind. I went with the group. We marched, we tore the flags down, we tore Stalin and Lenin and, um, and Mussolini and Marx statues and pictures, everybody that, that was involved to create communism. So we just out to the boulevard and we burned them and we, we served the soldiers that was fighting, we made their sandwiches, we given out the uh, the the emblem that says everyone that wants to be free 
March with us, come with us. We were making it as fast as we can and putting it and pinning it on people. And pretty soon Russia saw that something is coming. Something big is going to happen. So, for 13 days we begged the world, please come to our aid. Can't you see, once, once we are gone down, everything perish, everything is going back to them. The world was coming, Eisenhower was in Italy, but Stalin made announcement that if anybody starts helping the Hungarians, it'll be a third wide war. So therefore, many of the nations backed from us. They didn't want it a third wide war. And if Russia would let go Hungary, of the Eastern Bloc of the Communist occupation. They knew in Moscow that the entire Eastern Bloc they lose because they will rise also. They wanted to be free. So a, a lot happened. One night we met. My brother was a war prisoner in Siberia for three and a half years. He finally got freed and he said, I will never be a prisoner again. We have to get out. So his wife that was expecting a baby and their little girl three and their little boy five and our neighbor little girl, 11 of us patched together to get out in the middle of the night. We didn't have time to say goodbye to my sisters and my mother and father prayed for us and she said, Barbara, my daughter, I love you. Go and be free and don't you never forget who set you free. Don't you never forget that you are free. And it was Almighty God Snow began to fall. January 7th, we left our home unknown to other people. We rode the bus, the passenger train, but when we got to Budapest, we could no longer hide. So we had to wait on freight trains. We rode on freight trains. They told us they slowed down and we had to jump as far as we could. We rode in the snow in a bankment and it provided cushion for our bodies. The children cried, I am hungry, I'm cold, please cover me, and Barbara, please cover my little feet. I had no cover but the clothes what we had on, no food, no map, because if they find anything else on you, you were immediately executed. But if they didn't find any on you, and if they captured you, you were in life, in prison. So we decided not to have anything on us. We walked into villages in our journey. Some has reached out and gave us a loaf of bread. And then we walked again another day, another night, hiding during the day, running at night. We knocked into another village and a voice came, get out of here, what do you want from us? We want something to eat. We licked the snow for water. It tasted good, but we were very hungry. And they cast us out. They told us we were betrayers. Get out of here. We'll turn you in. Oh, then we ran. We ran faster. Pretty soon, we were approaching to the border. They told us that 3 o'clock in the morning, we should reach the the destiny of the borderline. But then how are we going to get through? There is, we had no pliers, nothing with us to get the bob wires to, to be cut. And here was a great big light to the left and there was a tiny light to the right. And my brother said, that big light is not an average home, but let's follow the small light. By that time, the snow was near to our knees and it was very hard to walk anymore. So we saw this tiny light and we walked there. And we never forget, a grey-headed lady has pushed the curtain aside 
as we knocked on the window. And she said, oh no, what do you want from me? We said, lady, we want nothing but tell us where we are. Oh, she said, my God, the border is about 50 feet back of my land. Run as fast as you can because you see this big light. That's where the Russian soldier station is. And they take turn in here every two hours. And it's about time for them to come run. So we ran, but we did not know how to get through the border. So we began to dig the frosty ground through the snow. We took turn and we had no feeling left, neither fingernails when we got through. Then we pushed the children through first, and then the adults one by one. And there was a hill, a rolling hill of Austria. Then it was down in a deep gully here, and we, were, we could not stand, so we were just rolling down. From the freeze, we could not put our teeth together because we were frozen halfway. And then we finally heard, quiet. What could that mean? No soldiers, no coming, no gunfire. Pretty soon they began to spray whoosh, whoosh, that hillside right beneath here we were lying. And we cried out to God in ourselves, Oh God, if you have helped us so far, help us to be free. Please don't let them go. And they did not come across the border. Internationally they can't, but they can kill you with a bullet. From then they withdraw themselves and we hear this huge crying. The German shepherd dogs were released after us. And when they coming up to that hillside, when we were below it, we know they will be up on us any time. And my brother said, hold on to the children's mouth. Don't even breathe if you don't have, because the dog follows the voice. <coughs> Pardon me. So we were quiet, as you can imagine, and listening to the noise that went on. My brother said, Please, don't make any noise. Hold on to the kids. From then on, we crawled on our belly to reach up to the hillside, and we saw a vineyard. It was a sign of lies. Somebody lives here. Somebody works here. There is a lies. And pretty soon, dawn began to come, and we saw this huge black thing, like a cross, coming toward us. In Europe, you find a crucifix in many corners, and that's what came in my mind. But then it began to move, and it began to speak. Please, don't be afraid. I am an Austrian policeman. I am coming to receive you. I receive many. And as he came, we fell at his feet, and we cannot move. We just cried and he has taken the children in his arms and loving them and speaking to them. And when we continue to cry, he finally said, Please, don't cry. Can't you see you're free? Oh, folks, can't you see you're free?